Welcome back everybody. This is the third part of the tutorial and in this section we're going to discuss about fundamental limits of community detection and we'll answer the question when can we detect communities. Uh, to answer this question we did a model and the model we're going to consider is a stochastic block model that Daniel already uh, mentioned a little in section 2. So let us give the definition of this model and for that we just give the definition of the model as it was defined in the original paper by Holland, Lasky and Hall and uh, Leonard in 1983. So we have P of X, which is a probability function for a stochastic multigraph. And already here, so multigraph, what is a multigraph? It's a graph, so you have objects that are interacting in pair, but the interactions can be of several types. So you may have, for example, in a social network, you may have two individuals that are interacting on, let's say, Facebook, but they are not interacting on another social network, for example, on LinkedIn or on uh, Instagram. Uh, and in contrast, two other individuals may be interacting both of fa on Facebook and Instagram. And so this gives you, when you have several types of interaction, you can model it with a multigraph. And for a stochastic block model, so you, in addition to that, you need a partition, B1, Bt, of a node into exclusive and exhaustive exhaustive set, so this means that your blocks or your cluster are not overlapping. And P of X will be a stochastic block model with respect to this partition, if and only if these two conditions hold. So the random vector Xij, which represents the interaction between node i and node j, are independent. And for any node i and j, i different of j, and i prime different of j prime, if you have i and i prime which are in the same block, and j and j prime in the same block as well, then the vector Xij and x i prime j prime are identically distributed. So this is the original definition, and the thing a bit uh, different from what modern approach use is this multigraph thing. So if we rewrite it, this original definition, really what happens is the interaction between i and j, x i j, is not just a binary number, 0, 1, it's a binary vector, 0, 1, m, where m is a number of type of interactions. Um, and that's really the original definition, but later, in like later work, people restricted SBM to a graph, not a multigraph, so they put it m equal 1. And so this is what we are going to do here. So what we'll call a SBM is really a graph where interaction between node pairs are independent, conditionally on the block partition. In the cluster, we're going to call it C1, CK to, to match a, a bit what Daniel did in the first section. And what's important is that if you are I and J, I prime and J prime are the same blocks and the interaction between them come from the same distribution. An important part of your case is a homogeneous SBM where you're going to have an edge between a pair of nodes, but if two nodes are in the same cluster, they will have an edge with probability P, and if two nodes are different cluster, they will have an edge with probability Q. And usually we assume that P is larger than Q, which means that you have homophily. Um, in other words, you tend to interact more with nodes that are in the same committee as you, than with nodes that are in different committees than you. And that's going to be the main model that we are going to consider. So P being the probability of interaction inside the cluster and Q being probability of interaction across cluster. Here is an example of such a graph. So on the left, we've generated a homogeneous SBM with 120 uh, nodes, three committees that we can see with the colors, blue, red, and uh, and green, and some probability P of interaction inside, which is 0 0.2 and Q 0 0.01. So what we see is we have more interaction inside the clusters than across cluster because P is quite larger than Q. Uh, and actually what we observe, so what we receive, is not the graph with the color, but just the graph without the color. So it's a figure on the right, so we observe the interaction between the, the nodes. And the question is, based on this interaction, can we recover the color? Can we recover the clusters? Um, and intuitively, if P is very much larger than Q, so which is a bit the case in our example, we have P equals 0 0.2 and Q, which is 0 0.01, so it's much smaller, then it appears quite easy, right? The cluster appear quite, 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 quite um, straightforward because P and Q are very, very different, right? But if I make P very close to Q, so let's say P is Q plus some small epsilon, then the problem will become harder, right? And the closer P is to Q, the harder is the problem. And when P equals Q, well, it's going to be impossible to, to recover because there's simply no information about the cluster uh, based just on the pairwise interactions. And so all the question is, how hard is the problem um, based on how close are P and Q? 
Um, and to, to tackle that, so we're going to need a few more notations. So for Z, which is a cluster, uh, a vector of a cluster, so, so Z, uh, it's a vector where entries ZI means the cluster of not I. Uh, we denote NA of Z, which is the size of a cluster A, so the number of nodes that belong to this cluster. And we're going to consider a parameter space, this carry graphic Z here, which is a space of, of cluster assignment, so that every cluster is roughly of size N over K, but we want to allow some imbalance into the cluster, so some small cluster, some large cluster, but every cluster be of size n over k times something. And so here we have a parameter beta, which reflects this cluster imbalance, which, and it actually means that the smallest cluster should be of size at least n over beta k, and the largest cluster should be of size beta times n over k. All right, so if beta equal one, which means we really want every cluster to be of same size, but by allowing a beta larger than one, we allow us to have smaller or larger clusters. And if we have an estimator z hat of z, we're going to define the loss as the, num the ratio of the number of missed cluster nodes up to a permutation. And what the permutation Daniel already covered in, in his section one is that we can recover only the partition, but not the exact label. So if I go back here on, on my example, on the figure on the left, we have color like blue, red, and green, which represents the the cluster, but what we are interested in is the partition. So if I change all the nodes that are in blue, I put them in red, and all the nodes that are in red, I put them in blue, I have the same partition, so I don't do any mistake in my clustering, it's just I haven't recovered the color, but I can't recover the color because I'm in an unsupervised setting. So that's why here in this definition of the loss function, we have a minimum over all the permutations, but otherwise the loss function is the ratio of missed cluster nodes. And our aim is to study the expected loss, so we take an estimator z hat, what what's the expected loss of this estimator when the graph is generated from an SBM, again, a homogeneous SBM with a block structure Z, cluster structure Z, P being property of interaction inside the cluster and Q property of interaction across cluster. And that's the quantities that we're going to, uh, to study. Uh, and we, show that we, we saw that it's going to depend on P and Q, right? And so we're going to introduce the rate divergence of order one half between Bernoulli distribution of with parameter P and the Bernoulli distribution with parameter Q, which is defined um, as a, the, the formula on, on the first line. And a theorem that was shown a few years ago, under some technical condition on beta that is not so interesting uh, here, so I will not discuss too much, if n times the range divergence divided by k log k is very large, then we have this result here. So this result means what? So it's a we're going to put ourselves in a minimax setting. So we're going to look at what does the best estimator do. That's why here you have the nth over every estimator that hat. So what does the best estimator do in the worst case setting? And the worst case setting for, so here we take the sup over all the cluster Z belonging to the space of calculated Z. And what does it do? So what's the expected loss so expected loss of the best estimator in the worst case. Uh, and actually, so there is a different scenario. So if you have two communities, then the best estimator, its expected loss will be decreasing exponentially fast in n number of, uh, of nodes times i is the random divergence divided by two. So that's if you have two clusters. If you have three or more clusters, then you also have an exponential uh, decrease of the expected loss, but in a quantity that is and i divided by beta k. So the, the fact that the difference between k equal to 2 and k larger than 3, we're going to explain it in the a, in a next slide. Uh, another thing that we see is if i is very large and the uh, expected loss goes to 0 much faster, right? It goes, the i goes inside the exponential rate here. Uh, and so why is there any divergence? We're also going to explain it in a, in a couple of slides. And here we're going to take a, a a bit more time to understand the theorem because it hides several things. Uh, the first thing is that we we look at the minimax rate, which means that we look at the nth of the whole algorithm, of the whole uh, estimator z hat, which means that if you have an algorithm z hat, I can tell you that its, its error, its expected loss, will be at least this rate here given by the theorem, right? Because any estimator, which means any algorithm, will have an error which is at least one of of this rate, so the rate depending if you have two or more than two communities, 
but at least that. So there's a lower bound hidden in this theorem. And another part is that this lower bound on the expected loss of, of any algorithm, this lower bound is actually tight. And it's tight because there are some algorithms that achieve this, uh, this decrease of, of their expected loss. And the question is, okay, which algorithm achieves this expected loss? Of course, not all of them, but some achieve. And in a way, the one that achieves this should be the considered as best algorithm, at least for, for clustering a stochastic block model. And so we, we know a few algorithms that, that manage to achieve this, uh, this uh, lower bound on the expected loss. Uh, one, one first that was shown is a maximum likelihood estimator, where you look at the um, partition Z that maximize the likelihood, given the data that you have observed, given the graph you observed. Uh, the only problem is you need to look at the maximum of all cluster assignment, and that's like K to the N of them. So it's going to be NP hard. Uh, but later, people show that two-stage algorithm achieve. So two-stage algorithm, the idea is you start with an initial clustering that you obtain, for example, using a spectral method or something like that. And on this initial clustering, you can show that its loss goes to zero, but it goes to zero not at an exponential rate, at some lower, uh, lower rate, maybe a polynomial rate, but it goes to zero. And then you go to a second stage where you improve this first uh, clustering and you prove it to get an exponential um, uh, rate of decrease of the expected loss. Uh, so that's nice, and, and the proof goes quite nicely, but the thing is, is two stages. So then the question is, okay, can I give an algorithm that just do it in one uh, one step or one stage? And actually the answer is yes, and so you can do it, for example, using semi-definite program, which are actually convex relaxation of the maximum likelihood ex estimator. So that, um, and that would give you actually the the minimax rate for, for the error in just one uh, with one algorithm. You don't need the second step. Uh, also, variational EM. So, for technical reason, in, in stochastic block model, we can't do an EM as we we'll do, for example, in a Gaussian mixture model. But there are some variational um, method to to, uh, to do something like EM, but the variational EM, and this also achieves this um, minimax um, decrease on the error rate. And finally, spectral clustering. Uh, in some settings can, can actually also achieve this exponential decrease uh, in the error rate. So that's for the minimax or the optimal rate for clustering homogeneous SBM. So as I said, in this rate there is a difference between what happened in two and what happened in three or more clusters, and let us try to explain this. Uh, and to explain this, we have to remember that we are going to look at the worst case setting, the best estimator, but in the worst case setting. So if you have two communities, you have two settings. So either two committees are of different sizes. And so, for example, you can assume that the first committee is larger than the second. But what it means if P is larger than Q, so if you have more chance to interact inside your committee, it means that if you are in committee one, so you are in a committee which is larger, which means that in expectation, you're going to have more friends, more, more interactions than somebody which is in the second committee because the second committee is smaller, right? And so it, if you look at the expected degree of a node in committee one, if this committee is larger than the second committee, then the expected degree of a node in committee one is going to be larger than the expected degree of a node in committee two, which means that already by looking at the expected degrees, you could get some information about the committee memberships, which hints that the worst setting is when the two committees are the same size. Because if they are of the same size, you can't do this trick. You can't also like look at triangles or stuff like that. This will uh, not work. And intuitively, the worst is happens when you have two committees of same size as the worst. And actually the n over 2 that we see in the error rate, n over 2 times i, the n over 2 represents the, com the size of the committee. So this is if we have two committees. Then something naive could be, okay, if we have three committees or more, I can put three committees of size n over 3, and this will give me the worst. Uh, but actually, no, this will give me an error rate, which is exponential of minus n over 3 times i, if I have three committees, or n over k times i, if I have k committees. And that's not the worst. Um, the worst actually will be to have two communities of the smallest admissible size and recall that off space calligraphic Z allowed for communities of size at the smallest size was n over beta k and the largest size was beta n over k. So if I put two communities of size n over beta k and then one big community of size larger, well, it turns out that this big community will be easy to, to cluster, maybe just looking at the degree will, will give the uh, uh, we we'll give already a good a good idea of the of the nodes that belong to this large committee, but the two small committees that will be very difficult to distinguish, and actually this will lead to an error rate of exponential of minus n over beta k times i, 
right? And so that's why we have a difference between two and more than two communities in, in the min-max uh, rate. Um, and now we can also look at why this result can, can be very powerful. And an example that we can give is the problem of exact recovery. So exact recovery means you want to re recover the partition correctly, to but totally correctly, which means you want to do zero mistakes. And if you recall the loss, the loss was the ratio of, of number of missed cluster nodes. So here we want the number of missed cluster nodes to be equal to zero. So n times the loss is the number of missed cluster nodes equals zero. But because the number of missed cluster nodes is an integral number, to say it's equal to zero, it's equivalent to say that it's strictly less than one. Um, and also in this slide, I'm going to only consider the case where I have committees of same size, so beta equal one or one plus the smaller of one. Um, and so first observation is the minimax error rate, so the, the theorem that we showed in, in the previous uh, slide, gives the expected expectation of n times the loss to be of the order n times exponential of minus n i over k. And here I don't have the difference between k equal to or more than two because I took beta equal one. That's actually uh, the simplification that I've done here. And I can rewrite this, as you see here in, the, in this first line of, by putting the n inside the, the exponent. And for example, if I scale p and q as a constant time log n over n, so p equal constant a time log n over n and q equal constant b time log n over n, I can do a Taylor expansion on the rainy divergence between Bernoulli parameter p and Bernoulli parameter q, which was my quantity i here, which is going to be up to second order term this square root of a minus square root of b square time log n over n. And if I combine these two observations, I get that the expected um, number of mistakes, so n times the loss, is exponentially decreasing. You have a log n and you have here a quantity 1 minus, and you have the square root of a minus square root of b square divided by k, which actually already gives me under which conditions this can be less than one or not, right? And this leads to actually the following theorem, which was proven a, a few years ago that you can recover exactly the communities if square root of a minus square root of b is larger than k, right? In that case, n times the loss goes to zero for the best estimator. So there exists an estimator for which this loss goes to zero. And in contrast, if square root of a minus square root of b square is less than k, then the minimax error rate will not go to zero, which means that any estimator will uh, will not solve the exact recovery, and so yeah, exact recovery is unsolvable in that case. Uh, and that already gets, uh, th those results already are a consequence of uh, the minimax error rate, but they were proven in, using different techniques in, in some paper in 2015 and 16. Um, an extension that we can do is, if we remember the, this modern definition of SBM, it really restricts to a graph, but the original definition was for a multigraph. Uh, and a multigraph, so nowadays are actually called multiplex networks or multiplex SBM. It's um, going to be um, similar to SBM, but the, the interaction between node pairs belong to a space S, which is 0, 1 to the power M. And that's a multiplex networks. But we could also mo model other things, for example, a weighted network, where the interaction between node pairs belong to R plus. Right, and so the interaction in that case will model how strong a connection is between two nodes. Uh, another thing we could model is sign networks. So in that case, you have two nodes, so these two nodes may not be interacting. So this interaction will be zero. They may be interacting, but they may be interacting with a positive interaction, plus, or a negative interaction, a minus. And this could model like friendship or enemy ties between, between individuals. Another example is sensor networks. Uh, in that case, so you assume that you have a latent graph but you're not observing this graph, you're observing, a, you're censoring this graph, so just a partial observation. And so for every node pairs, either you haven't observed this node pair, so you don't know if there's an interaction or not, it's unobserved, or this node pair, you have observed it, and an interaction is present. And the last setting is you have observed the interaction and there's no interaction, it's absent. And this is called sensor networks. But all of this takes, you could model it as a, a graph or where pairwise interaction between entities belong to a space S. And the space S will depend, if you consider multiplex networks, the space S will be 0, 1 to the power m. If you consider a weighted network, it will be a positive revalued, and so on. And we could define the SBM on, on such a space S where we have f and g, which are two property distribution on, on S. We have z, which is a the cluster of the vertices of the nodes. And we're going to observe x, which node is a n by n array where, whose element takes value in this 
interaction space S. And so that if Zi equals Zj, so I and J are in the same cluster, then I sample Xij from F. And if they are not in the same cluster, I sample Xij from G. And I cannot cannot this X being sampled from the SBM with cluster Z and property distribution F and G. Right? And this is an extension of the SBM as, as we saw before. And again, as we saw before, we saw that the key quantity was a uh, was a rainy divergence between the two Bernoulli's distribution, which, which were the two uh, um, comp competing uh, in uh, property distribution. Here, I have I'm going to define the rainy divergence of order one half between f and g as follow. And what we can show is similar as before. So if we look at the minimax error rate, so what does the best estimator does in the worst case uh, in this setting of an SBM, but where the interactions are not necessarily binary, but just any kind of interaction given by two properties distribution f and g. And I have, similar as before, a difference between what happened with two blocks and what happened with more than two. And the rate is given when two blocks n times the rate divergence divided by two, and when I have more than three blocks is given by n times i divided by beta k. And of course, this difference between two and more than three is really the same as before. The rate is really the same, so it, it it's really an extension of the previous result, but in a case here where you have interactions can be much more complex. Um, and why we can derive such a clean result in some sense is because we assume that f and g are known. So we don't tackle the issue of, um, of estimating them, which will be the case in practice. In practice, we will not know what are the interactions f and g. Um, and if they are unknown, that things are again, become harder. And there was some result in a paper a few years ago, but it comes with additional technical conditions. And it's still mostly open to to derive some minimax setting or, or derive some algorithm that achieves this loss if you don't know f and g. Um, and the last question that we need to answer is why we recover the rainy divergence here Again, so we had rainy divergence before for SBM with binary interaction. We have it here again with more general interactions. Uh, and we see that it's a quick key quantity. Um, and to answer that, so we're going to look at the following problem, which is simpler, but that's going to give us uh, actually the answer of this question. Um, and so the setting is as follow. So for simplicity of notation, I'm going to assume that I have n plus one nodes. So I'm just adding one node, but that's just for simplicity of, of um, derivation to come, and that I have two committees of one of size n over 2 and one of size n over 2 plus 1. And again, that's simply for, for simplicity of, of exposition. And I recall f and g denote the property of interaction inside a cluster and across cluster. And again, for, for notation y, so I assume the first n over 2 node belongs to committee 1, then the node n over 2 plus 1 to n belongs to committee 2, and the last node the node n plus 1, it belongs either to committee 1 or 2. And I'm going to study the, the following problem. Somebody gives you the label of the first n over 2 node and the, of the first n node. So it gives you z, which is like 1. So first n over 2 node belongs to committee 1, and the n node n over 2 plus 1 to the node n belongs to committee 2. The only thing you have to find is a committee of node n plus 1. Right? And how will you find it? Well, you're going to look at how this node is interacting with the rest, with, with other people. And so you're going to look at this vector x, which gives you each entry is the interaction of node n plus 1 with the rest of the world. So the first entry is a n plus 1, 1. So it's an interaction with, between node n plus 1 and node 1. Second entry is interaction between n plus 1 and node 2, and so on, up to the last entry, which is interaction between n plus 1 and n. And you're going to have two hypotheses to do. H1 means not n plus 1 is committee 1, and H2 not n plus 1 is, is in committee 1. If you look at under H1, what happens? Well, this uh, vector x of the interaction between not n plus 1 and, and, and other people, so it's the first n over 2 not belongs to committee 1. So if you make the assumption that not n plus 1 belongs also to committee 1, it means this first n over 2 increase of this vector x are generated from f. And respectively, the last n over 2 entry of the vector x are generated from g because you are going to look at the interaction between node n plus 1, which you make the assumption is in committee 1, with nodes that you know are in committee 2. Right? And this is under h1. Under h2, the opposite happens. 
x under hypothesis h2, so the vector x, it's first n over 2 entry entries are generated from g, and the last n over 2 entries are generated from f. This is a hypothesis testing problem. You can look at the maximum likelihood estimator for this problem, which in that case we answer h1 if, so here we download small h1, which is a PDF under hypothesis h1, if the likelihood of h1 is larger than the likelihood of h2, and you answer h2 if the likelihood of h2 is larger than the likelihood of h1. And this seems a classic hypothesis testing problem. So you could say, okay, we have um, some nice theory in hypothesis testing, which sometimes refer to Chernofstein theory, uh, which gives a rate of maximum likelihood uh, error. The only problem is here f and g are allowed to depend on n. So that's why we can't readily apply existing results, but things are very similar to to result, to, to, um, to existing um, theory, actually. And this is given by the following thing, that if you define the channel of information between the two probability distribution h1 and h2, which is given here by the sup of 1 minus t times rainy divergence north order t, so we can study the worst case error of the maximum likelihood of answering h1 uh, falsely h1, so you answer h1 but, you, but the correct hypothesis is h2, or you answer h2 but the correct hypothesis is h1, and we can show that the error rate of maximum likelihood is actually exponentially goes to zero exponentially fast in this Chernoff information between H1 and H2, right? And so that actually doesn't explain why we have rain diversion of order one half. This explains why the Chernoff information uh, should be the, the min max rate, right? Because in this hypothesis testing, what appears is Chernoff information. But it turns out that this Chernoff information can be related to the rain divergence of order one half. And this is going to be our next slide. So if we recall H1 and H2, where this um, measure like redefined here on the first line. And if we go to the definition of channel of information between H1 and H2, we have this sub here of 1 minus t times rainy divergence of our t between H1 and H2. The first thing we're going to use is the linearity of rainy divergence with respect to product measure, which means that we can re rewrite it as we first have a sum of rainy divergence between f and g, and the sum goes for the first n over 2 coordinates of, of and for the last n over 2 coordinates, we have a rain divergence, but this time between g and f. Uh, and so what happens, we have rain divergence of order t between f and g, rain divergence of order t between g and f. It turns out that the rain divergence is not symmetric, but there is a relationship skew symmetry, so that 1 minus t times the rain divergence of order t between g and f is equal to t times the rain divergence of order 1 minus t between f and g, which means that we can actually write it as the third line here, n over 2 times the sub of, and we have, one, we have 1 minus t times rain divergence between f and g, plus t times the rain divergence of order 1 minus t between f and g. And it turns out that this is symmetric at t equal 1 half, so the sub is actually achieved when t equal 1 half, and if you plug t equal 1 half in this equation, you get n over 2 times the rain divergence of order 1 half between f and g, by recalling that the rain divergence of order 1 half between f and g is is symmetric. And so that explains why from the channel of information we obtain the rainy divergence of order one half. So the n over two times the rainy divergence of order one half that we see in the error rate in case of two committees actually hides the channel of information. It's just a few lines of computation to get from, from one to the other. And so that, that explains the thing, sorry. Um, now just let us give an example of application of such result. Um, so we can consider, uh, for example, a, a weighted network, right, where the inter interactions are positive, like in R plus, and very often the graph we, we have are sparse, so which means like most not pair are not interacting, and just a few of them are, are in, in interaction. And we can model that with so-called zero inflated distribution, which means that F, we assume that it's a property distribution which has a mass at zero. So with property one minus A, time rho n, you're not going to observe any interaction between two nodes that are in the same cluster. And with property a time rho n, you're going to observe interactions. And this interaction will be simple from a PDF f tilde. And you can do the same for g. So you assume that between two nodes that are not in the same community, you're going to observe nothing. So you won't observe any interaction with property 1 minus b time rho n. And you're going to observe an interaction with property b 
time ran, and when you observe an interaction, this interaction is sampled from a PDF gtilt. Now we can assume that rho n goes to zero, which means most node pairs are not interacting, so it's kind of a sparsity setting. We can compute the rainy divergence because we saw it's it's an important quantity that appears in the in the um, error rate between f and g, and we can show this equation 3.2 that the rain divergence is of the order rho n time some quantity here, and in the first term we have the square root of a minus square root of b square, which is actually the term that we got if we did not have f t and g t, if we simply have Bernoulli uh, interaction with property a rho n and b rho n, and we have a second term here which is this 2 times square root of a b times the Hellinger divergence, or the squared Hellinger divergence between f t and g t, which is defined by this. So it's yet another divergence, and this will give you the information of how much how much quantity of information do you have between the um, between f tilde and g tilde? So by observing the label on the edges, how much information you gain versus that if you didn't have the label, you just have binary uh, interactions. And actually, similar to what we showed before, we can look at exact recovery in this uh, SBM with edge covariates and sparse setting, and we can show that exact recovery is going to be possible if square root of a minus square root of b square plus 2 times square root of a b times the Hellinger square between f tilde and g tilde is larger than k. So which means that compared to the exact recovery setting in, for binary or binary SBM, this term highlighted in red gives you the amount of information that you gain by observing the covariate, the edge covariates. And this is given by this squared Ellinger between f tilde and g tilde. Another nice thing is this squared Ellinger will be equal to zero if f tilde is equal to g tilde. Because, and this is intuitive because if you have the same distribution um, on the covariate, whether you are in the same cluster or across cluster, so if f tilde equal g tilde, it means there is no information in, in, in the values that you observe on an edge. The only information is whether the edge is there or not, but not its value. And it means you could just throw away the value to just keep whether the edge is they are not, and you will not lose information in that case. But of course, that's true only if f tilde equals g tilde. And as soon as f tilde is not the same as g tilde, then if you throw away the information, the weight of the edge, then you're going to lose information, and you're going to lose an amount of information that's highlighted by this quantity in, in red. Um, 